We've talked a lot about AFR gauges in the past, but one thing I neglected to mention is there are two types and why one is better than the other. So we better take care of that today. Now we've talked about O2 sensors before. I did a really, really good tuning video with the basics of it that really gives you all the details of this. But the O2 sensor's job is to measure the exhaust gas and provide the engine with an air fuel ratio number so the ECU can manage the fuel air ratio that's or the fuel ratio that's feeding the engine so i mean its job is very very critical and there's two different types of o2 sensors that we talked about in that tuning video one here on top is a narrow band o2 sensor the one here on the bottom is a wide band o2 sensor now we'll talk a little bit about the differences between the two but they've got the same job, but they perform it much differently. So that's what we need to concentrate on today. Now I know everybody loves this, so let's uh, let's draw out how an O2 sensor reads in both a narrow band and a wide band, and hopefully this will make a little bit more sense to you. So if we look at here on the left side, this is rich, a rich condition. This is stoic, and this would be a lean condition down here. Okay, stoic would measure straight across and cover on a on a gasoline engine anyway, and that's what we'll concentrate on today because I don't want to talk about diesel or anything else. But let's just say that stoic in this instance is fourteen point seven or one point zero lambda. Okay, so rich on a narrow band scale. On a narrow band scale would be up here, lean down here. So if you follow the curve of how that will f could flow into an engine, is like that. Stoic is right here, that's your magic number. Rich is a number up here, lean is a number down here. Here's the trouble with the wideband O2 sensor. It only reads from zero volts to one volt, okay? Here in the middle, 0.5 volts okay at stoic that is the reading that it is sending back to the computer at half a volt that you are operating optimally when the engine starts to run rich then the o2 sensor sends that signal back to the ecu and says hey you've got a little bit too much fuel here in the mixture you need to lean it out a little bit now, here's where that problem comes into play. On a narrow band O2 sensor, you don't know what rich or lean is. On the lean side, it could be 18 to 1, it could be 20 to 1, um, anywhere in between. Um, and not knowing that number is where the, the key is here. Same on the rich side, it could be 10 to 1, which is what we'll talk about here in a minute on a, on a wide band O2. Uh, it could be 11 to 1. I, I don't know. And that's the problem with the narrow band system is it doesn't give you a really precise number to measure by. So it, it will tell you when it's rich and it'll tell you when it's lean, but you have no idea what that number looks like. And that's going to become critical to us here in just a second when we talk about the narrow band O2 sensor. So let's draw that one out next. Now let's take a look at the wide band O2 sensor and how it reads. So same three things here on the left. You've got a rich condition, you've got stoic, and you've got lean. Those factors don't change, okay? Stoic is still going to run right down the middle of the fuel curve and uh, the exhaust curve, everything that's coming out. That does not change. Rich will always be there, lean will always be there. In the case of a wideband O2 sensor, okay, you've got a reading on the narrow band we talked about just a minute ago it had a zero to one volt reading on a wide band and this is the key here you've got a zero to a five volt reading okay one two three four and on down the line okay so when you look at stoic here it is reading around two and a half volts Okay, sort of a straight line there. And same situation here. You got lean running up through stoic and over here to rich. 
okay? The key to the wideband O2 sensor is they almost always universally read this way, depending on the type of the sensor and the type of the processor that they use to calculate that reading and send it back to the computer. But rich is almost always 10.1 lean is almost 20 to 1 okay and if you have a fuel condition that falls here and remember this is 14.7 this may read accurately on a gauge at 15.7 15.8 15.9 that reading will be very accurate with a number instead of you're just running rich you're just running lean so we talked about here in the in the narrow band you don't know what this number is that factor is out the door all as you know is it's rich or lean or it's running right where it's supposed to be in optimal conditions so that's the difference between the two is the wideband o2 will give you a number where you can base your tuning process on or if you're feeding it to a computer the computer can base its calculation on what that actual number is so wideband o2 sensor wildly better than a narrow band in that case because you can read the numbers very accurately very inaccurately okay so now that arts and crafts are done here <laughs> typically uh, the narrow band o2 system was used on older vehicles and again like we talked about it reads from that zero to one volt range there's not much information that can feed back to the computer it's either rich stoic or lean that's it the computer makes the correction to keep the engine as close to stoic as possible. Um, remember when we talked about here, if you're running rich, the computer will say, oh, and it's within that parameter that it falls into, it will adjust it back to get to stoic because that's where it wants to read. That's where it's optimal. That's where it gives you the best fuel economy. And that's where the baseline of it is set. If it's reading a little bit too lean and it falls within that range, it will adjust it again to get back up to stoic. The problem with all of that is if the O2 sensor, if you're if you're reading at 10 to 1, but the O2 sensor in a narrow band only reads at 12 to 1, it will make no correction. It is out of its range and it will make no correction until it comes back within range and then it will make the adjustment to the fueling. That's the biggest problem with the narrow band is you've got that, again, you don't have an idea whether the adjustment is going to be made or what the actual number is, but it's also that. If it falls outside of the range, it'll just keep operating as normal until it gets back within range, and then it'll make the adjustment to the fueling to put it back where it wants to. So very, very difficult piece to that. So the computer makes that correction to keep the, the fuel as close to stoic as possible and that adjustment is in a closed loop correction to the fueling now i believe we talked a little bit about open loop and closed loop again in the in the tuning video that i did with all the definitions and it's definitely one you want to take a look at because it'll give you a baseline of what all this stuff means and make it a little bit easier to, to understand what we're talking about here but the biggest positive to a narrow band o2 sensor or a narrow band AFR gauge is they are significantly cheaper than a wideband gauge and it's something that most people take into consideration when they're buying they will see the price on a narrow band so cheap and go well, I guess that's the one I need to buy I'll just buy it so now that we've covered a little bit of the basics of the, the narrow band let's talk about the wideband the wideband O2 sensor this is the sensor here that made all of the tuning that we do on EFI systems possible because when you are working on a narrow band, you don't have enough relevant information to make a good, educated, calculated decision on how to adjust fueling. The wideband O2 changed the entire game and allowed tuners and engines, if it's a computer-controlled EFI system, to make those decisions much more accurately. And that's why vehicles that that went from a initial narrow band O2 system to now a wide band are way better than what they ever were. And again, it gives tuners the ability to make great adjustments. So again, we talked about the wide band O2 making, uh, given all that information between zero and five volts, that additional range of, of measurement there or voltage allows for that really precise 
measurement of what's being expelled out into the exhaust. So when you get those really accurate readings on the on your AFR gauge or the computer gets those really accurate readings, it can make better adjustments, engines run better, they build more power, you don't leave anything on the table because you have adjusted out of it or you, you can't figure out what adjustment to make and it's, well, I guess it's running all right, I guess I'll leave it alone, but you may be leaving a lot of power on the table because maybe you're in a lean situation or maybe you need to, you're too rich and you need to lean it out a little bit to, to get it back into a little bit more, you know, range where it makes better power. So it's the, it's the, the beauty of the wideband O2. Now here's the downside in this system. When you're talking about a narrow band system, they are cheap. So there's got to be one that's really expensive, and that's the wideband O2 system in an AFR gauge. They are sometimes two and three times the money of a narrow band. Now, you can buy a good, decent narrow band system. I think it's been a while since I looked online, but maybe in that $30, $40 range to under 100 somewhere in there. These will run two, three, four, five hundred dollars for a good AFR setup. Now the uh, the fast one that I bought and we did a um, a video on here a couple weeks or months ago. Um, that one's a very very sophisticated one because it has a single O2 sensor or you can buy it in a dual O2 sensor and it is very expensive because these Bosch uh, O2 sensors are very expensive. They they're not cheap. Um, whereas the narrow band ones are very inexpensive. You can build a kit and a gauge very easily here. These are much more expensive, but I think the difference is pretty clear here. Which one is the better one for this, the situation that you're going to work in when you are trying to carburate tune or if you're doing EFI tuning. Now let's talk a little bit about when you would use either one of these and you'll hear a lot of guys, uh, you know, say that the narrowband O2 sensor is garbage, it's junk, it's pointless, it's useless, whatever negative term they want to use to describe it. And I don't disagree with it. It doesn't really have much of a place in anything that I do. But I can see where p potentially if, you know, somebody has a very stock car and they are just trying to drive and get the maximized most fuel economy out of the engine then maybe the narrow band is perfect for what they're doing. And I would have no problem putting a good quality narrow band O2 sensor and gauge in somebody's vehicle if that's all they're trying to do is stay at stoic and get really good fuel economy. So I guess, and it's limited because you don't have a lot of those folks out there, and or maybe you do, they just don't live in the world that we live in, so it's hard to say, but it's not useless. It just doesn't have much of space here with what we're doing. If your engine has a has a big cam in it, aftermarket intake, uh, bigger uh, compression ratio, then get the wideband O2 sensor. If you're running boost or nitrous, then get the wideband O2 sensor. Um, you know, if you have a, a three gauge panel, you know, hole in your car, and um, you know you're just trying to find another gauge to fit in there that will kind of move around and look cool and and maybe do something, then yeah, maybe spend the money on the narrow band AFR. But there's probably a dozen other gauges you could probably fit in that hole that would probably be better. So that's a bad example, I guess. But the point being is the wideband O2 is the way to go. And I felt bad the other day, and the reason why I'm making this video is I saw online. Uh, a conversation with some folks and you know the guy had just went out and bought a very inexpensive narrowband O2 sensor or uh, AFR gauge and it, you know how being online with you know Instagram or Facebook or whatever as soon as you make a comment that uh, doesn't really fit within the norm you know people tend to blow up on you a little bit and that guy got leveled for it and I felt bad about one that he wasted his money but two that he didn't understand the reason why uh, you would buy a um, you know a wideband over an O2 or a, a narrowband when there's so much more money so I hope that cleared a little bit of that up um, you know I, I hope that guy you know that's down the road will watch this video and not make that same mistake because I'd feel bad about that but uh you know, even though it's not my money, it's still a horrible thing. So anyway, I hope that cleared up some, uh, you know, some understanding of, of the differences between the two. Um, you know, the, the narrow band is very inexpensive. The wide band is very expensive. And this is one of those places you just don't want to cheapen out on it. Get the wide band O2, 
and the, the wideband uh, AFR gauge, you'll have a much better time and you'll get much more precise information out of it so you can make really good tuning decisions and get this thing done right. You know, so without an O2 sensor to capture all this information, you know, it's a longer tuning process for one, but it's one that's going to be incomplete because you just don't have a good measurement of what's going on there. You know, you may accidentally stumble into the optimal tune on a carburetor, but you'll never know that you're at the optimal tune because you're not getting the feedback from the exhaust telling you, hey, you've got this right. You've got it dialed in where you need to go. So the, the O2 reading on the AFR gauge is what confirms the adjustments you're making, and it tells you which direction to go. So very, very important to, to use this type of tool when you're tuning on a carburetor because you just don't have that many sources available to make good decisions when you're tuning a carburetor. So if you have any questions, please leave them down below. I'd love to answer them. If you got something out of the video, thought it was cool, leave me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Hey, at least it's feedback, right? At least I can measure it from there. See how we did that come full circle. So anyway, uh, appreciate the uh, you guys watching. If you got any questions, don't hesitate. And uh, we will catch you all on the next video. See ya.